Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Ellen Lapson, and I'm actually standing in for our dean, Mark Roselle, tonight, who's not able to join to give a very warm uh, word of welcome to all of you for coming to yet another wonderful program by the Hayden Center. And we're always thrilled to see the namesake and the uh, founder of the Hayden Center, General Michael Hayden, who's in the front row, and we're always thrilled to see you. And I think many of you have come to learn that these are really interesting conversations about very diverse topics, all of which have an intelligence angle to them, but are not exclusively about intelligence. Uh, tonight is a very special program in part because both of our guest speakers have a connection to the Shar School. So I just want to note, and Larry Pfeiffer will say more, but um, Aaron Sikorsky is an adjunct professor here, and Marisol Maddox was a graduate of the program that I direct, the International Security Program. So we're really thrilled to have them back on the stage. We won't let them leave the Shar School. They'll always be part of it. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to um, introduce the man who makes all of these events happen, Larry Pfeiffer, who is the director of the Hayden Center. All right. Well, hey, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Uh, I know it's a busy time of the year for students, and uh, it's a beautiful spring night out there. And so the fact that you're here really means a lot to us. Uh, for those of you in the audience who may not be familiar with what the Hayden Center is about, um, we are here to uh, put a spotlight on intelligence and how uh, intelligence informs, uh, or sometimes doesn't inform, uh, the policymaker. Uh, we do that largely through events like tonight's uh, event featuring prominent experts. Um, if you want to know about our events first, uh, go to our webpage, haydencenter.gmu.edu. And uh, on the right-hand side of the page, there's a little box. You can put your email address, and we'll send you notifications uh, at the earliest notice when we have new events coming. Uh, and we promise not to spam you. We really just use that to notify you about events that are coming. Um, our event tonight is also being live streamed on YouTube, so welcome to our YouTube audience. We are recording the event as well uh, so that others may be able to watch it later uh, who have not had the opportunity to be with us here tonight. Um, if you're not following us on social media, we are out there. We have a very active Twitter page. We are also on LinkedIn. We're on Facebook. We've got outposts on something called Mastodon and Post News, and we're always looking for some new platform because the social media environment out there is a very strange and weird one right now. So look for the Hayden Center at your social media location of choice. Uh, tonight, we are going to take questions from the audience, so as the event is going on, please think about the questions you might want to ask our guests. Um, we would ask you, uh, when David indicates it's time for questions, to line up at one of the two microphones on the opposite sides of the seats here, and he'll just go back and forth between the sides taking your questions. Uh, please keep your questions brief and actually make it a question. That would be great. Uh, let us know who you are, uh, especially if you're a journalist. We'd love to know we've got journalists in the audience and that you might write a story about us. That's great. Um, but if you want to stay anonymous, that's OK, too. I know some people prefer to stay anonymous. Um, our virtual audience, our YouTube audience, if you want to ask a question, use the live chat function in YouTube. Type your question in there. We'll be monitoring that, and uh, we'll bring your question uh, to David's attention uh, as we move our way through the night. Uh, following the event, for those of you who are here in person and those of you who are not in person, you're just going to be jealous. We've got a uh, reception with food and beverage, uh, and tonight it's actually going to be outside on the plaza. So it's a beautiful evening. Uh, we're going to sit outside there uh, as the sun goes down and the stars come out, and uh, uh, please enjoy uh, the food and the drink, and, and hopefully our guests will stick around for a little while for you to have a little one-on-one -on -one time with them. Uh, tonight, the Hayden Center is going to look at climate change. Climate change is a subject that's been given renewed emphasis in the U.S. national security and defense strategies. It's featured prominently this year in the annual threat assessment that was developed by the U.S. intelligence community. So we thought it was really a good time to bring this subject to the fore, and we brought together some experts here to uh, inform you as to why you maybe should care about climate change from a national security and intelligence perspective. Our moderator tonight, uh, as has been the case in many times in the past, is David Priest. David is the director of analysis for a company called Bedrock Learning. It's an enterprise social learning network for enterprises that touch on global affairs. 
It's a spin-off of something called War on the Rocks. Some of you may be familiar with the War on the Rocks uh, internet platform uh, that has been a go-to source for national security information from insiders and thought leaders. If you want to know more about bedrock learning, talk to David over a beer after the event tonight. Uh, until recently, he was the publisher and chief operating officer at Lawfare and at the Lawfare Institute, uh, another online and podcast source of national security information and insight. Uh, he has co-hosted a podcast called Chatter uh, with Shane Harris of the Washington Post. Are you continuing to do that? Yes, and I am. will be continuing to do that, so look for Chatter at uh, your podcast uh, source and uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, Chatter, uh, I took a, my mother lives in Florida, long, long drive to Florida, and Chatter is one of the podcasts that I catch up on when I'm on my trip to Florida, so I highly recommend it. Uh, he's a former CIA analyst and briefer. He wrote a great book called The Book of Secrets. It's the really preeminent source, uh, open source uh, information about the president's daily brief of intelligence. Uh, looks back at the history of that from the John F. Kennedy administration going forward. So if you've not read that book, go to Amazon, order it. You'll make him and his publisher very happy. Um, he serves as a senior fellow here at the Hayden Center and has been a visiting professor at the Shar School of Government as recently as last fall. Our panelists tonight, in the middle, we have Erin Sikorsky. She is the director of the Center for Climate and Security and also director of the International Military Council on Climate and Security. She previously served in the U.S. intelligence community for over a decade, um, most recently as the deputy of the Strategic Futures Group uh, on the National Intelligence Council. Uh, for those not familiar with that organization, you may be familiar with their premier publication, something referred to as the Global Trends Report uh, that uh, does a forecast of the future. If you've never read a Global Trends Report, highly recommend you go to the National Intelligence Council website and read the last couple of them. They're really uh, are fascinating and informative. Uh, in that capacity, she also led intelligence community analytic efforts on environmental and climate security. She is, as Ellen mentioned, an adjunct faculty here at Shar. so if there's a Shar student in the auditorium and you've not taken her class and you want to know about it, corner her afterwards and I'm sure she can tell you about it. It's a pretty popular class. Uh, she publishes extensively uh, as well in all kinds of journals and publications. Uh, here at the end is Marisol Maddox, Marisol is a senior Arctic analyst at the Polar Institute of the Wilson Center. And if you're like me, when you hear Polar Institute at the Wilson Center, you think a bunch of people sitting around with hoods and furry things and you know, their hands, and but they probably don't, but it just sounds like that. Um, she is a core expert as well on the Arctic at the European Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats. She's a non-resident research fellow at the Center for Climate and Security with, uh, uh, with uh, Aaron. She teaches at the Department of Defense's Regional Center, the Ted Stevens Center for Arctic Security Studies, and at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. She is also extensively published on Arctic issues, uh, and uh, as Ellen mentioned, she's, uh, we're very proud of her uh, as a graduate of her International Security Graduate Degree Program here at Shar, and uh, um, evidence that uh, you can come to Shar uh, with an interest in a topic that there may not be a defined path forward and uh, uh, the Shar School will work with you and define that uh, academic program with you to make sure uh, that we are uh, meeting your interests and producing uh, good uh, future national security leaders. So with that, I'll turn it over to David and thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Larry. We have no shortage of things to, to talk about. Uh, so I want to jump in, but I'm not going to, because first I have to say thank you to both of you for, for doing this. Uh, you talked about a, a couple of the overlapping areas. Uh, obviously, here the Shar School at George Mason is one of those that we share. Uh, you are two of my very favorite guests on the Chatter podcast right here on stage. I'm actually kind of hurt that you haven't invited me to the Center on Climate and Security <laughs> because everyone else on the stage is linked, so we'll have to correct that later. Uh, Aaron, let's, let's start with you. We've got a lot of things related to climate and security we could talk about. Help us all get our hands around that. What are, what are some ways of, of organizing how we look at the intersection of climate and climate change in what we traditionally call national security studies? Sure, no, thanks David, and thanks to the Hayden Center for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. I know it's a beautiful night outside so that you chose to be here. Um, I, hope, I hope we live up to your expectations. Um, you know, so I worked in the intelligence community for a long time on a lot of things that were not related to climate change at all. 
and I, but I was leading teams that were supposed to look at risks of conflict, right, in East Africa and the Middle East. And climate and environment issues kept coming up again and again as drivers of conflict and instability. And I realized I didn't know a heck of a lot about how climate worked, how environmental risk worked, and, and, but it was becoming more and more important. And, and so, I mean, a simple answer to your question is there isn't an issue in foreign and security policy that isn't going to be shaped in some way by climate change, right? You can't, you can't leave anything out. But if you want to organize it and think about it and, and think about the different ways in which climate shapes these risks, I usually put them in, into a few different buckets. Um, I start with the direct risks of climate change, right? And these are the risks that extreme weather events, whether it's you know, heat waves, hurricanes, flooding, pose to US, in this case, national security interests. That can be our military bases in places like the Gulf Coast when they get hit by hurricanes like uh, they have previously that cause billions of dollars of damage that interrupt uh, training and operations, wildfires in California that cause the National Guard to have to go and fight fires, interrupt training there, shut down bases. You can look at last summer across Western Europe where heat waves and droughts caused the deployment of thousands of military troops to respond, right? So all of that falls in kind of the direct risk bucket. And we see these hazards coming more intensely and more quickly uh, than climate scientists even predicted. We're on the cusp of an El Nino uh, uh, climate pattern here. And if you've read the papers recently, scientists are warning about extreme heat in the coming year. That will all have direct security impacts to our security services and to our security infrastructure. But beyond that, the second bucket of risk, and, fr and frankly, that bucket is, is the one that's easiest to deal with, right? The military, I would argue, and we can talk about this, I think is pretty on top of that and, and recognizes it and making investments to manage it. But the second bucket is where it gets a little harder. And this is when climate change shape layers on top of other existing threats, where it compounds existing risks within already fragile states within states already facing conflict, right? Uh, between states where you already have uh, high levels of mistrust or competition. Uh, and, and there are many examples we can point to here. The, the civil war in Syria is often used as the, the shining example of, of climate change where you had a drought uh, on top of a highly divided society. It drove folks from rural areas into cities put a lot of pressure on those cities. The government wasn't able to cope and responded uh, with, with force. Um, but you can look at East Africa, right, where you've had a confluence of terrorist groups, of very poor governance, and then you've had drought, you've had locust plagues in recent years driven by climate that have all exacerbated the instability and conflict there. I think you look at what's happening in Sudan right now, frankly, and it's not that climate change is the key driver of what's happening there, but climate change is certainly playing a part in, in making that country and the people and the government much less resilient to other shocks, right? Um, you look at places like India and Pakistan, India and China with shared, uh, shared uh, water sources, shared river basins, and the role that climate change is playing in, in in uh, shaping the, the water access there among countries that have nuclear weapons and that don't like each other very much, right? And so that's the compound risk of climate change. Uh, and I would argue that even there, we're, you know, the, the US, national intel or US intelligence community did a national intelligence estimate uh, in 2021 on the risk of climate change at the behest of the president. It's an excellent document. If you haven't read it, I would highly encourage you to do so. Um, but even that document, I would say, underscopes what the second bucket of risk, because it really focuses on places that are already highly vulnerable, like the Sahel, like the Middle East. And I think these, these um, uh, instability and conflict risks go much further than that, frankly, as we look to the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and then the third bucket I, would, I look at is the risk of what I call the risk of response to climate. So as we move through the energy transition, right, as we move away from fossil fuels to renewable energies, as the world thinks about things like geoengineering, right, which you may have read about, uh, a response to try and cool the planet 
right? Um, because we're blowing past <laughs> uh, the, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere that will, that will keep us below two degrees Celsius, which the, um, is often seen as a threshold um, for where really bad things happen. Um, as countries try to respond to climate change, that causes geopolitical risk, that causes um, risk of tensions between countries, strains within countries. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try to respond to climate change because the risks are very high, but it means that as we do that, that can cause uh, conflict uh, risk as well. And so all of these are things that the US national security community, the intelligence community, where I worked for a long time, um, should be front and center on their plates, frankly, because um, it, it really, the, the baseline is shifting, right? Uh, it's reshaping uh, the world in a way where a lot of assumptions we have in, in the security community will no longer hold, right? A lot of our policies, a lot of our analysis, you know, I mean, David, you know, we do key assumptions checks in the intelligence community all the time, right? If you change your assumptions that underlie your analysis, how might your analysis change? Climate is throwing out all sorts of, of key assumptions that we have. And I'll, I'll end here just by giving one example. My first, one of my first jobs in the intelligence community was as an analyst on East Africa. And we were supposed to warn of risks of conflict and instability there. And we had a lot of assumptions about when insurgent groups in Somalia would fight based on when the rainy season was. Right? And our, so our warnings to the president, our warnings to DOD were rooted in an assumption that we knew how the rainy season shaped their fighting. Well, the rainy season doesn't exist the way it once did, right, in East Africa. So if you as an analyst are still warning and still using that assumption, you're gonna get things wrong. You're gonna tell the president and the PDB the wrong thing about when to expect conflict. And so we need to, and that's just a very small tactical example, but there are a lot of big examples as well. Um, and so I just think it's a, it's a, it's a shift in how we approach, approach these issues. I am I'm really impressed, first of all, that you were able to, to, to arrange it that way. And secondly, that you were able to talk about all of these effects using examples without referencing the Arctic, which is, which <laughs> well. is amazing because it's an area where a lot of these effects are, are largest and may have the largest secondary effects. So Marisol, I'm gonna ask you to, to uh, apply some of her framework in a moment, but first talk about that part, which is why the Arctic is seeing some of the most dramatic effects of climate change now and how that's playing out in ways that, that will affect national security. Sure. Um, and I want to reiterate my appreciation for being invited to be here tonight. It's really an honor, uh, General Hayden, and thank you to everybody for coming out on a beautiful night. Um, so yes, yeah, so the Arctic, uh, I chose this region to study because it is changing faster than anywhere. Um, when I had first started out um, looking at the Arctic about 10, 12 years ago, there was this idea that, oh, like it's been changing around two times faster than the global average. But now, over time, we've realized that it's actually um, been changing a lot faster and that there are, some of the methodologies had made it so we actually didn't realize how quickly it was changing. And so the Arctic is warming about four times faster than the global average. And part of that is due to something called Arctic amplification, which is this idea that because the Arctic has traditionally been an ocean surrounded by land mass, so the complete opposite of Antarctica, which is a continent covered in ice that's surrounded by an ocean, the Arctic is, is an ocean, but it's had this polar ice cap. And so what's happening is as the, the Arctic Ocean is warming, you have the polar ice cap shrinking and thinning. And so you're losing that multi-year ice and that really um, deep white that has really reflected a lot of the heat back from the sun. And so as it's shrinking and thinning, uh, and it's basically leading to more heating of the water. And so you already have uh, the heating from the greenhouse effect, but then that's amplified by greater absorption of the heat that is coming in. And so um, this is something that um, is also exacerbated by something you may have heard of called black carbon, which is basically, um, it's uh, like 
carbon residue, a lot, a lot of times from wildfires or from um, ships that are using certain types of fuel that basically um, leave this residue on, on the ice. And that dark color is something that is also exacerbating this Arctic amplification effect. Um, and so as the Arctic is warming, um, we're having increased access to the, like above the north coast of Russia, there's the Northern Sea Route, which is becoming navigable for longer. And so Russia, especially since the, the full scale war in Ukraine, has really doubled down on the strategic importance of the Arctic elevating it within their maritime doctrine last year from the number three region of strategic importance to the number one, and is essentially sees its ability to realize the full economic potential of their Arctic zone as a national imperative. And so this is something that um, is causing them to really um, try to unleash industry in a way that is um, more conducive to transboundary risks to the United States because they've been doing things like waiving um, environmental assessments or giving a lot more liberty to industry with not having inspections and things like that because especially with the effect of sanctions, they are really interested in just getting these different resources developed and getting them to market. Um, and so, so basically, um, sorry, let me <laughs> I think that I think that covers yeah, that's... the waterfront, so to speak. Okay, uh, but but I do want to follow up with a little bit of application of the the buckets here. So you talked a little bit about a direct effect and a little bit about the the transnational effect, um, but there's also that that mitigation circle that could come back. So I'm thinking as you're talking about uh, you know Russia, Russia, Russia because of the long coastline on the Arctic Sea. But you also have China declaring itself a near Arctic state and suddenly investing in icebreakers in a way, I think, still beyond the US Navy and Coast Guard. Uh, so, so you have geopolitical competition playing out in a region that uh, hasn't been done that way before. When it comes to those various buckets, which ones have you been focusing on the most recently? What's one issue that you think the Arctic really, really shows the value of analyzing it this way? I mean, I use Aaron's buckets all the time <laughs> because I think it's really about understanding that the climate, the climate change challenge that we're dealing with is unlike any threat we've faced before. And it's really about understanding convergence, right? So you have the kind of more traditional security dynamics playing out, but then the climate dimension adds a whole another level of complexity um, and so, I, I mean, we're just seeing changes happening so fast and such extreme things happening that, you know, we're blowing past benchmarks in time frames that are, would, were viewed as like unheard of. So like in 2019, there was a extreme heat wave um, that led to the uh, extreme loss of ice from the Greenland ice sheet. It was about 12 and a half billion tons of ice just in that one month. And that had not been forecast to happen until 2070. So, and, and the Greenland ice sheet is actually, it's so large that it generates its own gravitational pull of the ocean towards it. And so as it's losing ice mass, it's not only contributing to sea level rise, and it has 21 feet of sea level locked up in it. It's not only contributing to sea level rise, it's actually pushing it towards the eastern seaboard of the United States. And so when you get the different dynamics, like um, you know, in, in Virginia, uh, the, the Hampton Roads area, which is a critical um, place for, for US military um, activity and our naval forces, uh, you have issues with land subsidence combined with the, the impact of, of sea level rise. And so that ties in with, um, you know, certainly when you're thinking adaptation, we need to be much more thinking about worst case scenario, especially when it comes to hardened infrastructure. Um, but then also domestically, like in Alaska, we had, um, it was 
actually I wrote the number down if I wanted to get it exactly right because it's like just so extreme. We've had 10 billion snow crabs die because of the warming that we're seeing in the Arctic Ocean. And I would add the Arctic Ocean is acidifying four times faster than the global average because cold water acidifies faster than warmer water. And so we've had these 10 billion snow crabs that have died and has collapsed a $200 million industry in Alaska. So this is not something that's like, oh yeah, in the future we need to think about it like for our kids or our grandkids. Like there are very profound effects um, and those are just two little examples, but they, they evolve in a, in a much more complex way because um, there's also research that uh, there's a, a higher level of ability to create attribution to understand how changes in the Arctic are directly linked to changes in monsoon precipitation. And there's actually um, strong evidence now that change in the Greenland ice sheet is directly linked to a um, dramatic decrease of West African monsoon precipitation, which is really important for the Sahel region of Africa and ties into um, all of the ways that non-state armed groups are um, causing challenges in that region. Erin, let me connect this to something that we see globally and you track globally, uh, but it has an Arctic manifestation. These are things like uh, wildfires, right? The, these events that occur more often and in places that they didn't always occur before. And Siberia has seen just incredible wildfires in the last few years that haven't gotten as much attention as they probably should. Um, talk about both the drivers of that and the consequences of that and, and how that is in turn amplifying climate change. Sure. So it's. You know, it's another place where it's it's not climate alone that's driving these events. It's climate plus other things, right? Plus poor governance, plus environmental degradation, plus in some places extremist or armed groups that that are acting in in ways uh, to amplify these these events. Um, and and as wildfires occur, um, that uh, in in the Arctic, and I mean, I think Marisol knows this, this better than me, but it, it creates this amplification effect then too with the permafrost and with um, destroying carbon sinks, right? Um, so it's a, once, you, once you start down this path, it's very hard to get back out of it, right? And, and, and the thing I think that's important for national security is there's a lot that we don't know still, and there's a lot of variability with these types of hazards that are very hard, I think, for the national security community to plan for, right? Because I think for a long time, the national security community has held the environment and climate as, as stationary, right, in our strategy and planning and analysis. And that stationarity no longer exists. And it's not just that we're moving to a new normal of warmer temperatures or more extreme events, but again, it's that I'll, I'll say this word a lot, but it's, it's the variability, it's the up and down, right? And so it makes planning, I think, especially in the type and the way that we plan, very difficult. Um, and an example I'll give you that maybe will illustrate this is I think sometimes you read about Russia and climate change, and Russia's identified as a winner, right? Because we look for winners and losers. Who's going to win and who's going to lose? And Russia's a winner because the Arctic will open and that's where they operate. They're very comfortable there. Temperatures will get warmer in Siberia and they'll have a longer growing season and they'll be able to take advantage of that. But it's much more complicated than that for Russia. And there's actually a lot of things that, that hurt Russia from climate change as well. They're the country with the most infrastructure on permafrost, right? Um, and, and as permafrost melts, that infrastructure is, is no longer usable. And again, I don't know Marisol knows, knows more than I do. And, but also, Russia doesn't have the capacity to take advantage of some of these things like a longer growing season, right? They don't have people. They don't have the economic infrastructure to, to um, take advantage. They're under sanctions. So if they were able to grow things, they can't get it out to market anyway. And, and so it's just much more. It's, it's not linear, I guess. Um, and we're very used to, I think, looking uh, at things as, as linear. Uh, either it's a threat or it isn't. Either there's a winner or there's a loser. And it's, it's much more complicated. I know that didn't totally answer your question. I went in a different direction. But. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a, a, a reflection of this is, is something we've talked about before, which is uh, related to your first bucket, which mm -hmm. is 
it's a national security issue because national security assets are being deployed to deal with climate change directly. Mm -hmm. And we see that all over the world. And you had this epic Twitter thread going at one point that I lost dozens and dozens of examples from everywhere around the world of military applications uh, of this. But there's a flip side too, which is you think about, and I'm trying to think about Siberia, this massive landmass with these dramatic effects. Yes, the population is low, but th there still need to be some, some mitigation of it. And yet, Russia right now has its military kind of busy somewhere else, mm -hmm. and they're not exactly dedicating lots of, uh, lots of military assets to deal with mm -hmm. the effects of climate change, which can lead to some runaway effects. Yeah. And that, that's particular to Ukraine right now, but it's not particular to humanity. Um, we, get, we get distracted by something that's more immediate, in some cases for good reason, mm -hmm. and, and we don't address the thing that we could, and that can include with military assets. So when you're thinking about this and, and, and how that's likely to play out, not just Ukraine, Russia, but overall the ability of us to dedicate resources where we need to collectively, how do you feel that's shaping up and is it meeting your worst or your best expectations from a few years ago? It's incredibly challenging, I think, for governments to think long term. Um, I think we're in a better place, at least here in the US, than we were a few years ago. Um, but I think even, even countries, you know, let's take China, for example, which gets a lot of credit sometimes for being very forward thinking. You know, they think in long term strategy, they have a climate adaptation plan for their country, which is very forward thinking. Um, but you look at something like the pandemic, where they also on paper had a really good plan of how to manage something like that. But when the immediate crisis hits, you don't follow the plan on paper. You manage <laughs> as best you, you know, the, the political incentives weren't there for them to report up bad news and actually follow the plan. And so I think it's the same with, with climate, when it's a trade-off between if my job in China as a local government official is to ensure the economic viability of my town or my province, I'm not going to do what I should do on climate because I need that that economic uh, growth right now. And I, I think you see that in a, in a lot of places. Um, but here in the US, I would say the military is actually at the forefront in many ways of, of managing and planning for climate change and investing in the resources that they need to be able to respond to these uh, hazards and, and recognizing that that investment costs a lot now, but it costs a lot less than it will uh, uh, down the road. You know, on your point about Russia and, and Putin not paying attention to what's happening in Siberia, it was really interesting. Right before uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, President Biden was giving a speech publicly kind of warning Russia, like, this is a bad idea, you shouldn't do it. And there was a line in the speech where Biden said, you know, what you really need to worry about is you've got burning tundra that will never freeze again in your backyard. And he said that in his speech. And I, you know, I'm sure he didn't think that would actually change Putin's mind, but that he or his team thought that putting that in there was important to highlight, I think says something about a recognition of these issues and how they're shaping uh, threats within countries and, and pressure points potentially. Another overlap with Russia and the United States and climate is an institution that's been around, what, almost three decades now, called the Arctic Council. And if you haven't heard of it, it's a fascinating thing to study. And talk, it, it reveals something about the way we, we cooperate across international borders in uh, different ways for different topical areas. Um, Marisol, how, how is that Arctic Council going since Russia's invasion of Ukraine? <laughs> Yeah, so um, it's it, there have been some challenges because uh, Russia was actually chair of the Arctic Council when they decided to wage this full-scale war against Ukraine. And so because of that, uh, it was really important for the other seven Arctic countries to put a pause on the body as a way of denying Russia the political platform that's typically uh, afforded to the chair. Um, the challenge is that it's a consensus-based body. Um, it has a chairship that rotates every two years among the, the eight Arctic states. And they basically, because its mandate explicitly excludes military security, the focus that has allowed it to survive since 1996 when it was created, even when tensions were high in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea, 
um, was because it has focused on the areas of mutual interest. And so those are primarily sustainable economic development and also scientific research with climate change being the super obvious factor that is really behind a lot of the changes that we're seeing. And so through the working groups of the Arctic Council, you're able to convene experts from di different scientific research institutes and universities and um, really um, have maximal cooperation and data sharing on transboundary issues. And so um, that that's where the, the war has really had a, a stifling effect on the ability to make progress on areas that we really need to make progress on. And so after that initial pause, there was some pushback, particularly from the indigenous peoples who were referred to as permanent participants in the Arctic Council, essentially saying, look, like climate change is not going to stop accelerating just because the political will to be cooperating is diminished. We can't lose progress on these issues. And so there was this limited resumption of working group activity that had been approved by all eight Arctic states, but that did not actually include Russians. And so that ended up being about two thirds of the work, but it's highly um, handicapped essentially in, in the way that you would typically um, have you know, deliverables that would come from the work and that would feed into the next chairship. Uh, that process is very hindered. And there's even certain research that's been held up in peer review because of Russian scientists that are involved. Um, but, but some of these are like very serious issues that affect not just the people of the Arctic who are at the front lines of change, but also issues that have potential global consequences. And I would say just one example of that was some work that was being done through a cooperative effort with a few of the working groups and some research institutes on uh, biosecurity threats from the Arctic. So as we're seeing permafrost, which makes up about 15% of the Northern Hemisphere, and you, you have ancient carbon from sometimes millions of years ago that's starting to be upheaved through some of these abrupt thaw events. Like in the Russian Arctic, you have these very uh, very visually impactful methane craters where essentially you're getting this, this thawing of the permafrost. So you get the microbial activity that's activated and it causes this buildup of gases and it'll literally explode through the ground. And not only is it releasing methane, which is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, and it's not accounted for in our carbon budget, by the way. Like we only account for linear thaw. So there's a serious gap there that we're seeking to address. Um, but it also is resulting in carcasses from the Spanish flu graveyards that are starting to be re-exposed to the atmosphere. And in 2018, there were um, some caribou carcasses that, that were um, exposed and they had died of anthrax and it actually reanimated in the environment and not only got a, a, made a whole herd of caribou very sick, it actually killed, um, I believe it was at least one kid in Siberia. So there's like a lot of concern around not just viruses, but fungi and bacteria that are starting to be re-exposed to the atmosphere, entering atmospheric circulation, entering waterways, or potentially being out there in the landscape that people could just have contact with, people who live there. Um, and obviously coming out of COVID, uh, or you know, kind of out of COVID, um, that the potential for future pandemics is really you know, top of mind. And so that was something that these working groups were seeking to develop better monitoring and indicators and better research collaboration that would help to, uh, you know, reach the goal of preventing future pandemics and employing something called One Health, which is a CDC recognized concept that if we want to prevent future pandemics, we need to understand that human, environmental, and animal health are inextricably intertwined. And so we need to take a systems approach towards pan future pandemic prevention. So we've defined the 
problem pretty well. Uh, but let's talk about some national security solutions and ways of addressing this. Uh, Aaron, you looked really closely at the national security strategy when it came out in, what, October mm -hmm. of last year? And Larry, you referred to that up front. Uh, talk a little bit about the national security strategy and what it reveals about the way that, for lack of a better term, the American national security establishment is framing and looking at climate change. Yeah, so I think the national security strategy is an example of the kind of approach to, to get to the solution space you're talking about. Um, of how to think about climate as a security issue because when you read the document, you see that, that climate is integrated throughout the, the report. It isn't just a paragraph tacked on at the end, you know, and climate change as a threat, but instead it talks about how climate change intersects with the other big security risks that we're worried about, China, Russia, for example, terrorism, um, and it talks about how they intersect and how you can't think about one without also thinking about the other. Uh, sometimes when I deal with members of Congress, they'll ask me, they'll say, well, how do you rack and stack climate change as compared to all these other threats? Where does it fit on one to 10? And I often say very politely, but that's the wrong way of framing the question. Instead of is it more important than China, it's how does climate change impact competition with China? How does it drive Chinese national security interests? How does it create vulnerabilities for China? How might it create vulnerabilities for the US if we think about having to fight a war in Taiwan and if in a climate change world? And that's, I think, the national security strategy did a really nice job and explicitly said, you know, this is as important and must be considered um, in, in, in parallel. It's one thing to say that, though, in a national security strategy. It's another thing to create a national security apparatus that can actually do that. And I think that's where right now with this administration and a lot of the agencies you see a real their struggle. I mean, they, they want to be able to tackle this, but our, our systems are not set up in a way to really integrate a systemic approach, right? You're a China analyst or you're a climate analyst, right? <laughs> you're not someone who, do, who does both necessarily. Um, and so building that integration. Um, and there are some, some uh, things I'm seeing that I really uh, I like. The State Department has created uh, foreign service officers that are climate officers that they're putting in country teams and in embassies, which I think is the right approach. Um, you know, I see work happening in the intelligence community, DOD as well. All of the combatant commands are doing uh, climate wargaming. Uh, some of them have already done it. There are more, more to come, which I think is a really good first step. The next step to me is to not do a separate climate war game, but do your regular war games, but just put climate <laughs> in there. Um, but a lot of it's workforce, I think, too. Like, who are the, what are the skills that people have that they bring to the table? I don't think you need to replace all our smart analysts at CIA with climate scientists, but you need smart analysts who are climate literate, data literate, and that know where to go to get the information. Um, the last thing I'll say here that I think we need to see more of too, and I, there are some pilots of this going on, is you need, we need more co-creation between the, the federal scientific community and the security community. So it's not just enough to bring them together and get them talking, but I think in the analytic world, I'd love to see like sprint teams on some of the most serious climate security problems we have, where you've got folks from the national labs right, sitting down with really smart country analysts and, and really doing that analytic work together on, on these problems. Because as, as Marisol keeps rightly pointing out, it's a systems risk, right? And so you need to address systems risk. You need lots of different types of people in the room together tackling the issue. You know, that, that specific recommendation actually reminds me, Marisol, of uh, your recent paper. So if you, if you all haven't seen it, you, you will, because I know after this event, if not during the event, for those of you watching on YouTube, you're gonna go to Google and search Polar Institute Intelligence Community and you will find <laughs> the paper that Marisol just uh, co-authored and published there, talking about what the intelligence community should be doing to address the intersection of climate change and national security and support the national security strategy and the tough choices that policymakers are going to have to increasingly make. Uh, that is one of your recommendations, in fact, to try to increase this partnership what are some of the other recommendations you make in terms of senior personnel, like a, a national intelligence manager for the Arctic um, issues? 
um, as well as some of the more practical issues of how to work at a person-to-person -person level. Yeah. Um, so the main issue, essentially, that we're trying to kind of problem solve for is, again, this idea of convergence, where um, Aaron has written really um, brilliantly about this idea of, like, climate as the shaping threat. So for, Ch for the US, China is our pacing threat. Climate is the shaping threat. And so we really need to be um, you know, understanding that, that level of how it intersects with all these other issues that we're dealing with. Um, and so one, um, one recommendation and, and I think there, there is an, actually an example of, of where this maybe would have been helpful. Um, there had been a mandate from Congress for all US bases in the Arctic and subarctic to do an assessment of their exposure to climate risk. And essentially, there then was this Pentagon Inspector General report that came out kind of lambasting the bases for not doing it right and for really kind of thinking about climate change more as, as something like weather um, or energy. And so the way that I kind of view it is, well, did they have the tools to even know what to look for, right? And this is what speaks exactly to what Aaron was just saying about we need to have the integrated capacity to understand how things are changing and what that means for you know, for the commanders of, of certain bases, right? So um, if they had, uh, you know, just the go-to resource to be like, hey, I just got this directive, like, can you help me figure out what this means? I think that's a much more productive kind of approach towards risk management and, and you know, readiness assurance than giving somebody a directive without the proper tools to carry it out. Um, and I think that also because, unfortunately, the climate change issue has been pretty politicized in the United States, when you're trying to just convey this as like, this is just something that, you know, like, we're either going to get in front of this accelerating risk or we're not, like, we're in this together. It's not about politics. If you kind of give somebody a bad experience with trying to, to deal with it, I, and maybe they already were kind of like, oh, I think this is just some you know, political pandering to their base. It's not really a real issue. Uh, you know, that can kind of create more of a sour taste. And you're like, oh, like, I knew this was just about kind of pandering to the base. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if we really want to understand how climate change is affecting everything from readiness to homeland security, like there is a real lack of current climate integration into even how um, accelerating climate change could tie into extremist messaging domestically or into information operations. Because it's very easy when you start to learn about climate risk to be like, um, this is really scary. Uh, we're not currently doing enough, but we can. We actually do have that ability. We just need to you know, really take this seriously. But at, in the kind of current state, if we continue to not get this right, fear-based recruitment is going to be like, you know, the easiest thing in the world because they're going to be right, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So it's just about, yeah, having those tools available. And then for the specifically for the Arctic and the U.S. intelligence community approach towards the Arctic, currently there are three combatant commands that have areas of responsibility uh, in the Arctic. And so uh, my co-author and I, um, he, his name is Liston Lee, he's fabulous, longtime um, intelligence community expert. Um, he and I had this idea for creating a national intelligence manager, um, which would kind of be somebody who would um, report directly to the director of national intelligence at ODNI um, that could ha kind of have the pan-Arctic perspective. And that would facilitate also um, better, more efficient use of certain sensors or collectors when you have limited resources and you want to make the most of them, kind of understanding how the Arctic as a, as a whole is really, the dynamics are really changing because of increased accessibility. And so I think having um, more of an approach that understands that it's not about the sectoral kind of, which is the, the current way that it is, it's really about understanding it as a whole. I'm going to encourage everybody to, to think of your questions now, or if, like me, you have way too many to narrow down your questions. Um, and in a few minutes, we'll go to the microphone. Uh, 
Marissa, let me follow up on that with one of the recommendations you didn't mention, because I was fascinated by it, because it gets so specific, and we can get specific here, because like, this is our crowd to talk about specific national security things. It wasn't that long ago that NATO added a center of excellence on climate issues, and I think the, China, uh, the Canadians are taking the lead in that. You recommend taking it a step further and adding a center of excellence on high altitude issues, specifically ISR, and I'm wondering if you can talk through that a little bit, because that is a very practical national security implication dealing with international alliances, partnerships, national security technology, and yet you say there, there's a hole there that needs to be filled. Tell us about it. Yes, so one of the recommendations is for a high latitude ISR uh, center of excellence. And um, this is essentially the idea of this is that um, we need to be increasing our domain awareness in the Arctic. And there are also ways in which, you know, there are certain activities in Antarctica as well um, where there are some questions about China's intentions and kind of what they're doing. And there are limited uh, ways to, to monitor certain things. And so I think that taking um, a strong allied base approach um, you know, bringing this into the alliance, but then also potentially partnering with Five Eyes, so you know, helping to support Australia's ISR um, capabilities could really help to uh, not just, you know, it's, it's about really all domain awareness. So it's including better monitoring of the regional changes that are occurring from climate, but also just really strengthening our ability to uh, detect and track any type of activity um, that may be occurring in the Arctic as there are kind of new avenues of approach and the region is opening up. Uh, I would say that, you know, kind of the, the balloon example was one, one example of something where, um, you know, th that kind of opened this this box of kind of questions around like, well, wh what are we detecting or what are we tracking? And, and then there were some kind of interesting moves afterwards in terms of calibrating and, and you know, shooting certain things down. But I think it just kind of spoke to um, the larger need for just really strengthening all domain awareness in the Arctic. Um, and particularly as we are having, uh, it's kind of a slow process with NORAD modernization. Um, that I think that this is something that could help to supplement that. You all knew we'd get to the Chinese spy balloon, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's obligatory for any event here from now on. Um, I'll encourage you to uh, choose a microphone on either side of the auditorium to ask your, your questions. And to tee it up, Aaron, I'll ask you uh, briefly just to give us something that makes you optimistic in all of this. What's Because we've, we've dealt a lot on what's going wrong, what could go wrong, and the limited ways of mitigating it so far. Um, but give us just a sentence or two on, on what's something to make us feel good. Sure, two things that make me optimistic. One is the class I teach here, frankly, and the students that show up for that class and how they don't need any convincing that climate change is a national security issue. They just get it, right? And they don't understand why anyone wouldn't get it. Um, the second thing that makes me optimistic, I've spent a lot of time in the past couple of months with military logisticians, right? Who have to move things from point A to point B. And they are seized with this issue, right? Because they know if they don't bring climate change in, they won't do their jobs right. They won't be able to do them well. And so that they care so much about this and are really thinking deeply has really impressed me and, and makes me hopeful. Great. All right, let's start over here. Please introduce yourself, if you will, and uh, ask a question. Sure. I'm uh, Ben Zalisco uh, with CRDF Global. Uh, no one's talked about ice breaking ships yet. So I figured, uh, could you comment on naval postures and where that sets up uh, the strategic landscape? It's all you, Marisol. <laughs> oh, yeah, so uh, our icebreaker situation is woefully insufficient at best. We have one icebreaker dedicated to the Arctic and one dedicated to our treaty obligations in the Antarctic. And uh, they both need replacements. And at the very least, we need to have that self-rescue capability in the Arctic. Nobody wants to call the Russians <laughs> for help. Um, but you know, in all seriousness, um, you know, Coast Guard, there's one Coast Guard district that has the Alaska um, in its, as its area of responsibility with 11 missions 
it's becoming a much larger region where they have responsibilities and they do not have adequate surface assets to conduct all of those operations. Uh, you know, in September of last year, there was a, a joint naval maneuver with uh, Russian and Chinese uh, naval assets, and you know, Coast Guard responded. You know, God bless them. But th it's a massive area when you look at the size of it, and so uh, you know that ability to to actually have surface presence and power projection is really important. Um, and that just kind of keeps getting sidelined. Even in the last omnibus, uh, there had been funding for uh, basically for Coast Guard to get IVIC, uh, which is a, a, something that could, an icebreaker that could be adapted to help Coast Guard um, at this time, but even it's really not ideal for, for the conditions that we're, we're dealing with. Um, but that, that funding like got cut overnight, just disappeared, so we were all like, where'd it go? Um, so it's just something that really needs to be prioritized. You know, we're looking at uh, like 2030 for the first re icebreaker replacement, and that one's supposed to go south, not north. So we're going to have to figure something out because it's uh, it's a serious it's a serious issue. Thank you. Please. Uh, good evening. I'm Adam uh, uh, Adam Schultz, a student here at the uh, Shar School. Um, what emerging technologies would you say are most likely to have the greatest impact on climate change, whether that be positive or negative, and in what ways? Aaron. It's a great question. I think there are a lot of interesting uh, renewable energy technologies um, that will have a positive benefit. I think uh, there's some interesting things regarding circular economy, especially even for the military, uh, which I think could be uh, really helpful. I'll be honest, though, I think the bigger problem for climate is not a technology problem. We, we, we know what we need to do to, to cut emissions, right? Um, it's a political problem. And so, I, well, I certainly think technologies will be helpful, and we've got to figure that out to move, especially for the military, right? Um, I think sustainable aviation fuel, I mean, there are some other things that will be helpful, um, but, but it's the politics that really need the attention, in my opinion, more so than the technology. What about more spy balloons? Would that help? <laughs> well, but I mean, that's the, the geoengineering, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, anyway, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Thank you. La Thank you. Larry, what you got? OK, so uh, I'm going to channel the uh, conversation coming from YouTube. Uh, this question comes from a YouTube viewer named Bit. Uh, they state that the IEA is forecasting that Asia is set to use half the world's electricity within the next two years. The Indo-Pacific region is also predicted to have the most economic and population growth in the world in coming years. Much of their reliance is still on thermal coal and other less clean fuels. How can countries like the US have an impact on helping to offset the volume of that challenge going forward uh, on climate impacts, particularly when further complicated by great power competition? Just that. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an Arctic question. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a good question and one that, frankly, a lot of groups have been been grappling with, with a huge amount of focus on India and on Vietnam and the other Mekong countries and, and China and how do you incentivize um, the, the transition away. I, I think for the United States, I mean, when we think about our allies and partners in the region, it's a huge opportunity to have co-benefits to the great power competition, right? If we can invest and help those countries invest in clean energy uh, and renewables, if we can help them invest in the adaptation as well, because a lot of these countries are already feeling a lot of the, the effects of, of climate, and, and they want that, that funding from us. I mean, I know Larry at the beginning mentioned the annual threat assessment. Um, the annual threat assessment this year highlighted something really interesting, I thought, on the geopolitics of climate change, where it warned that the growing divide between the global north and the global south over climate finance is a geopolitical risk, right? And, and so I think if it's an opportunity for the United States to provide that financing 
not because it's the right thing to do, though it is, but because it, it helps us in the geopolitical moment that we're in, and it's how we're gonna get those countries to move um, away from, from coal and things that are, that are uh, carbon intensive. Mm -hmm. Great. Please, go ahead. Um, greetings, I'm Michael Hammerschlag. I'm a journalist and I've written about this stuff for 40 years. Uh, plus, I was a, a reporter in Russia for, in Ukraine for 15 years, and I've been to Murmansk twice. Um, w w you know, when do you think the uh, Arctic ice cap is going to break up? I mean, we expected that as early as 2016 or something, and I understand it's almost nothing now. It's 92%, you know, it's like maybe a half a meter to a meter, and, and it's slush, a lot of it. And, uh, you know, what do you think? And the, and the effect of that's going to be like eight times greater heating on the dark, dark ocean than the, the shiny ice. Um, and, and maybe you could talk about that, all these there's about eight or nine huge feedback loops that are all coming into play, burning the, the peat um, reserves in Siberia, you know, these, these wildfires that are just like not going to stop in Alaska and, and across the Arctic. Um, and and how you know they'll affect it because I don't know I, frankly I, I all this the security stuff is all very very accurate and smart but it's you're just thinking way too small you know because it, because it seems like you know they're talking about once once every thousand year flood or once every thousand years and then two years later <laughs> another one's happening and I think that's going to happen with COVID this is this is like a, a shot across the bow and it, it seems you know this warming is going to just cause like unlimited uh, pandemics. So. Let's, ta let's take that in the, the polar ice cap context. And then maybe also since you work at the Polar Institute, my understanding is there are two of them, that you could talk also about the Antarctic situation because we haven't talked as much about that, but I think it's worth mentioning in contrast with the polar ice cap. Yeah, so um, the latest research I'm seeing is that we'll have the first ice-free Arctic summers in about 10 years. Um, and, you know, I get a lot of questions when people hear that. They say, oh, so, like, we can start sending ships up there. And it's like, I don't think you're understanding that, like, a, if that's the case, you're going to have a lot of other very complex dynamics playing out in the rest of the world. Uh, and the second part of that is that as the Arctic Ocean is, yes, the trend is that it's becoming increasingly accessible, but unpredictability is really the norm in the near term. Because you can go out there uh, and it's ice free and you know, you're like, oh, smooth sailing. And then overnight you can get this rapid ice up and you just get these really dramatic changes in, in, in the state of the conditions that actually are a very uh, serious hazard to mariners. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there was actually, I think one example that really speaks to kind of that disconnect between the Russian language with um, when the, like the ever given got stuck in the Suez Canal, that mega container ship, uh, you know, Russia was like, well, there is this northern sea route that you can just bring your ships up this way. And I mean, first of all, the northern sea route has depth and width constraints that would never allow one of these mega container ships that's made for that just on time economic model to even fit up there, right? So. Um, that's just, it's, it's not feasible, right? It had to be something that's a lot smaller. But also in um, the fall, uh, about a year and a half ago, there was about a dozen ships that ended up getting stuck in the Russian Arctic because of a late season freeze up in October. Like you're in the Arctic, this should not be surprising that you're gonna get serious ice conditions. But because of Russia's rhetoric of, oh, it's gonna be increasingly accessible for longer, uh, th this was something that, you know, I think it was a real wake up call to the shipping industry about kind of the reality that, yeah, when we when you set out, uh, maybe it looks good, but those conditions change. And you can also get much more dynamic ice flow conditions as well. Um, so it, there's a lot of complexity to it. But I mean, you're, you're right that we're, we're seeing, you know, changes, like I said, a lot faster than we had expected. They're extremely complex. And prior to Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, 
it had been my deepest hope with working on this issue. I, you know, I did the international security degree here with a focus on transnational challenges for a reason, that I view this as like the most, the, the greatest shared threat that we do all face. And I had been really hoping that it, it would be something that would be extreme enough to really have radical levels of cooperation. And then, of course, with Russia's invasion, you know, they've severely limited the ability to, to engage in that way. And we don't have time for it. So, but, but there are other things we can be doing, which we should be doing. Thank you. Um, let's move to your, the microphone on your right. Go ahead. All right. So my first question is, <clears throat> I've heard that in case, if the temperature of the Earth raises significantly, that there is a re risk of large scale release of methane hydrates on the seafloor. Um, do we know how many, like how, what the mass of those are, and also where those deposits are located? And my other question regards the Antarctic ice sheet and how fast it is melting. What is the temperature um, increase like there compared to the rest of the world? And should we be concerned about the East Antarctic ice sheet or large chunks of it melting in the near future? The most recent things I've heard have said, no, it'll only happen over thousands of years of sustained climate change. But people have said that before about Greenland and the West Antarctic. So I wanted to make sure that the science has not changed and we don't have to worry about the East Antarctic ice sheet. Or maybe we do. Maybe we're all screwed. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll ask both of you to weigh in on this. So Aaron, you go first. Well, I'm going to let Marisol. I, I'm going to admit on on the methane question, I don't have a good a good answer for you. That's a science question, well beyond my <laughs> my capacity. Okay. Uh, I'm actually working on a methane project right now, so I, c I can answer that. Um, and the, basically, the answer is that we're still seeking to quantify. Um, yeah, the methane hydrates and, and subsea permafrost in general. Um, so it's not something that we have a, a super clear understanding of, either in terms of exactly how extensive it is, but certainly also the question of um, the time frames that we're dealing with in terms of release. Uh, and this is something where uh, the, the permafrost issue in general it is basically like the, the carbon curveball for uh, international climate policy because our carbon budget has not included the emissions from permafrost thaw and our models, our climate models only include, and just in the last couple of years, um, permafrost thaw emissions, but in only in a linear way. So it's not accounting for any of these abrupt thaw events, which um, Aaron referred to earlier with some of the wildfires that are occurring in the permafrost regions. Uh, we're, we're getting these things called zombie fires, which is when the, the basically like the peatlands, right, and like the permafrost areas are ignited, and then uh, they actually like kind of smolder underground throughout the winter. And then in the spring, they'll reignite. And so none of these are accounted for um, in our current climate models, partially because it's very hard to quantify and dif very difficult to predict. Uh, but this is something that you know, scientists are actively seeking to address. And there's a, actually a Swedish um, research institute is currently seeking to um, update the um, the UNFCCC global stock take um, in, to include the permafrost emissions um, up to 2022 to try to give us a better sense of what we're dealing with. But it's incredibly important because this is the key to understanding the time frames that we're working with. Um, and what we've essentially realized is that we're seeing higher levels of warming and change at, or sorry, higher levels of change at lower levels of warming. So this idea before that you could, you know, if we limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and don't allow it to pass two degrees Celsius, we should be okay. That's out the window. There was an OECD report that came out in the fall of last year that was on global climate tipping points. And it was specifically uh, one of their findings was that it's no longer valid to say that uh, we are at low risk of crossing some of these 
these tipping points if we do keep warming below two degrees because we're seeing changes now that we did not expect to see um, at, at the current rate of warming. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know about Antarctica. I, I do the north, I don't do the south. Uh -huh. <laughs> well played. Uh, we're gonna go into rapid fire mode here where we're gonna take all three questions that we have in the room and then Larry, if you have any more you wanna shout out, that's fine. But go ahead and we'll start here, ask your question, but, but I'll hold everyone back. And then we'll take the other two questions and we'll either combine them in, in answers or you can pick them off one by one. So start us off. Thank you so much for the, the talk this evening. It's been superb. Um, my name's Doran Tucker. I'm a doctoral student at George Mason's de um, Department of Communication working with the Center for Climate Change Communication. As I'll keep us in the Arctic um, as we change chairship. I'm curious, do you see opportunities as, as Russia leaves the chairship? Are there renewed opportunities? Okay, thank you very much. Please go ahead. Hey, uh, my name is Carter Coudre. I'm a student fellow in the uh, Center for Security Policy Studies here. Uh, it's great to see you both. Um, also staying in the Arctic, uh, you know, it dawns on me that uh, as uh, Russia or China or any other entity tries to project power in this you know, very uh, dynamic region of the world, economic power could be just as important or just as projecting as military or any other sort of power. You know, if you were a policymaker, what requirements would you have for the intelligence community regarding economic activity? Is it certain bilateral relationships or industries or anything else? Great, thanks. And please, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, sir. I'm uh, Joshua Nam Tae Park, from visiting scholar from South Korea and PhD and uh, Navy captain retired. Uh, thank you for this uh, beautiful uh, talking. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, this question, uh, uh, I want to ask this question to Ms. Uh, Chikorsky. Then um, regarding uh, China and uh, US uh, in terms of uh, climate change issue, because I'm specialized for China and North Korea military and China's strategic thinking. Uh, uh, specifically, China's Communist Party strategic thinking. My question is, is there any cooperative action uh, between US and China on climate issue? Further, what is the China's attitude, variation of attitude of climate issue? Uh, I have two reasons to deliver this question. First, inherently climate change issue more likely to produce cooperation because this is cross-cultural, cross-national, and cross-continental uh, issue. Second reason uh, what I deliver the question is China's strategic thinking. China's Communist Party, they try to more likely to cooperate when they are weak and they, when they are disadvantaged of some situation. And in fact, they had two uh, cooperation uh, uh, in the process of revolutionary war with KMT led by Chiang Kai-shi, then they had been very successful and finally overcome. Then, then I think that, uh, that's the reason I want to deliver this question regarding China. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, Marisol, I'll start with you with the first Arctic question, maybe the second. So the Arctic Council, the chairmanship changing, and then if you want to take on what uh, IC requirements could develop regarding particularly economic activity in the Arctic. Yeah, so um, with Norway taking the chairship tomorrow from Russia, God willing, um, basically, so I mean, if anybody can do it, it's Norway because they've had to deal with Russia as their neighbor for a very long time. So I feel like they are best positioned um, to, to kind of be grappling with this challenge. So far, it does seem like the turnover will happen. On April 14th, Russia handed over the scientific, um, the, the, the tools to coordinate scientific research um, through the Arctic Council to Norway. Um, but the, the challenge is essentially that up until like now, with Russia being the chair, even though the, Arc the seven other Arctic states 
uh, had paused their activity with Russia, Russia has had this kind of alternate universe of their chairship a calendar where if you look at it, it's full of events and they're you know saying that, oh, we're, we're meeting about this now and our chairmanship is going super well and their ability to kind of keep up the facade is going to go away because they will no longer have control over the calendar. It's going to be Norway's. Um, so essentially, we're going to be dealing with, with a couple things here. So one is going to be what the, the seven other Arctic countries are willing to do with Russia. I don't expect that we will be uh, looking to re-engage with the Russian government in any meaningful way. Even the chair, sh the um, ministerial tomorrow, normally it's like the foreign ministers or the secretary of state that will attend. And it's been demoted to essentially just civil servants uh, that are there to procedurally go through the motions to, to hand over the, the chair. Um, but so, you know, the, if we're able to continue some level of cooperation at a very technical level, that's very boring. I think that is the best way to do it because it won't attract kind of the, the media attention that would make it look like, oh, wow, like they're re-engaging with Russia. Like in no way can there be any concessions to Russia as things are still escalating in Ukraine. That would be completely inappropriate. And Russia needs to see that there are costs to their actions when they do something like violently invade a peaceful neighbor. Um, and let me ask and, you also, do you have any yeah. quick thought on the intelligence community re requirement question? Yes, okay, so I'll just quickly add that the next piece is basically gonna be Russia's response, right? Mm -hmm. Russia has agency. And so the extent to which they recognize that it is actually in their interest to maintain this Arctic 8 construct and so they likely will demote Arctic Council, uh, you know, it, its importance to them and kind of look elsewhere to be getting a lot of the work done. Um, but, but that speaks to Russia's concerns about opening up the floodgates in terms of who, if they did disrupt that Arctic 8 construct, who could argue for a larger role in the region. It's not just China, it would also be like the European Union, which has been seeking to, to strengthen its role in the Arctic as well, which Russia does not want. Um, and then the point about um, you know things around economic activity in the Arctic, after taking Dr. Louise Shelley's class here on transnational criminal organizations and illicit trade, 100%, I would say, transparency and anti-corruption because the transparency um, piece is just so key to preventing uh, financing of groups that are completely undermining climate policy and uh, other types of policies that are, you know, we need to have confidence that if enacted, certain policies are gonna get us to where we need to go. And if there's distortions around that because of things around illicit finance and groups that are undermining those efforts, uh, that's a real problem. So I think much more concerted uh, effort into that, because especially with Russia being so weak, with their official policy of parallel imports, uh, with just the history of transnational criminal organizations in and through Russia, that's going to be a really big issue um, in, in the Arctic, especially if we have high LNG prices. Aaron, we'll, we'll close with you. Uh, any thoughts on those, but particularly on the China-US issue? Sure. One thought on intelligence requirements in the Arctic. I think for both Russia and China, they do not have a bright line between military activity and economic activity the same way we do in the US. So if I were asking questions to the intelligence community, I would want to know about their gray zone activity, right, and, and what might be covered for something else. On the China question, I think it's a great one, and I'm really glad you asked it. I think it's really important for the United States to understand how China itself views climate change yeah. and how it views it as a risk, right? And I think China does view it as a risk, right? You look at their climate adaptation plan, you look at things President Xi has said, they recognize that they're vulnerable, right? And that's going to drive their behavior, much more so than what the US does or doesn't do on, on cooperating with them in climate. I think in an ideal world, yes, I would like both the United States and China to publicly cooperate and say this is a top issue. But I think China's 
going to tackle its own emissions only when it thinks that it has a, it's in its national interest to do so. Uh, we did a paper last fall on China's climate security vulnerabilities, which again, I just think we in the US need to spend a lot more time understanding how China itself thinks about this and then use that in our engagements with them on, on the topic to drive change. And I do think that even in a world where China and the US aren't cooperating, which frankly is the world we're in now, that doesn't mean we can't still make progress on, on the climate issue. And we need to be thinking creatively about how we continue to move forward on, on climate, even uh, in this competitive environment. Thank you. Larry, over to you. All right. Uh, thank you to our two great panelists. Um, this, th th this was a conversation we've been wanting to have for some time here at the Hayden Center, so I'm glad we have finally done it. Um, you know, if you think of the future of national security, there, there, there's, as, as Aaron suggested, every aspect of our national security is going to be interwoven with how we respond and react to the climate issues that we're dealing with. So um, to close, uh, re reception outside on the plaza. Please do join us. Plenty of food, plenty of drinks. Um, the next Hayden Center event, uh, still a little tentative, but uh, I think I can go ahead and, uh, and announce that uh, uh, on the 30th of May, so it'll be you know right after you get home and shake all the sand out of your you know sandals after being at the beach or something. Uh, the 30th of May, we're going to host the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, Lieutenant General Scott Barrier, for a conversation about uh, uh, DIA, its mission, its uh, focus, uh, his, his tenure at the agency, which will be coming to an end sometime this year. So uh, please be on the lookout for notifications about that. Hopefully we'll get some notices out, that, uh, out, out on that in the next few days. And I uh, hope you can join us uh, for that event. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us, and good night. Thank you.